Network webinar series organized by the Center for Asia Leadership. My name is Faustino John Lim, and today's webinar is on leadership development in the new normal strategies to create a future ready workforce with our speaker, Nipur Todi, who is joining us from Mumbai, India. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, our center is an organization that is based out of Boston, United States and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, operating in several cities across Asia. We were founded at Harvard University among fellows and alumni, and we are focused on helping leaders in Asia initiate change and manage progress in their organizations and communities. We are in the midst of a webinar series, and the purpose of these webinars is to encourage and educate during these uncertain times. So wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for joining us. We have over 100 registrants from 20 countries and representing several industries. And joining us, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our speaker. Joining us from Mumbai, India, Nepur Todi is a leadership consultant and facilitator with over 10 years of experience in diverse industries. She has a master's at the Harvard Graduate School of Education where she developed her expertise in adaptive leadership and also overcoming your immunity change framework. So, uh, Nipur, it's great to have you. Good morning, good afternoon. It's great to be back. Uh, John, always a pleasure uh, to have a wonderful host um, to, and look forward to a very interesting conversation today. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it's your third time joining us and it seems like you are always in high demand. So how, how is everything in Mumbai these days? Oh, great. Things are good. Pace is picking Improving. up, which is a good sign. So, yeah. Okay, that's good to hear. Are you still working from home? Yes, I am. Looks like for the rest of the year. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, I know you're keeping busy. So anyway, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. But before I give you the floor, let me just go over some of the protocols and reminders. So do participate in the polls. Uh, we do have one poll before we give the floor to Nepur. Um, uh, if you have any, um, any comments that you would like, please feel free to share it in the chat box. Uh, you will get a copy of the slides and the resources. Um, as we are operating in several cities virtually, please be patient with any tech slips, if any, that we might have. So we apologize in advance if that should happen. And also please learn and enjoy. So um, we, over the next 45 minutes, uh, we will do a poll right after this. We'll get right into the interview with Nepur, uh, where she'll focus on these two questions. Uh, please do have your questions ready. And even throughout the session, you can submit any questions that you might have in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen, okay? Uh, with that, why don't we just get right into uh, the first question, which is what have been the biggest challenges for employers in developing leadership capability? So Nepur, the floor is yours, go ahead. So thanks, John. I think it's a very important question, um, especially in today's time, right? Um, when we start as, um, as leadership, when I say leadership here, I mean as senior leaders of the organization, CEOs, CHROs, uh, managers of our team, which start questioning really, um, you know, from a budget perspective, from a time perspective, whether we should spend um, on leadership, uh, learning and building this capability. And I think uh, that this crisis has been a testament of the fact that leadership is a very important quality that we all must have, right, irrespective of our designation. But I just want to begin with a, with a small story that I recently read, right? Uh, this is about a tourist who visited uh, the house of a Sufi saint, right? When he visited the house, he was astonished. And because he saw there was a very simple home that he was living in, it just had a kerosene lamp and a mat for which, on which he would sleep. So the tourist asked the Sufi, where is your furniture? The Sufi asked back, where is yours? The tourist said, mine. Uh, you know, I'm just a visitor. And the Sufi saint replied back, well, I'm a visitor too. I think this kind of talks about how we approach leadership development. Um, there have been a lot of furnitures, concepts, frameworks um, that have been built over decades, right, in this whole space. Uh, how many times do we visit it just like and be agile about looking at what we really need, right? And this crisis has also sp spoken about 
uh, what's essential and really focusing on that. And then constantly just coming in and out, just like the Sufi saint, right? Like just coming in as a visitor. So with that, uh, if we can move to the next slide, I also want to just quickly set context in terms of why this is an important topic from a very statistic point of view, right? Um, over the last uh, 20 years, uh, we have seen a constant influx of cash flow from organizations. Uh, today, uh, there's approximately 370 uh, billion global spend happening on leadership development efforts. But yes, but yet there is a huge gap that we're noticing um, in actually making this successful. Um, you know, the studies from uh, McKinsey, Harvard Business School, and some of the statistics that you're seeing here, 64% uh, still believe that building the next generation or having a healthy, strong bench of leaders is still a challenge despite the number of uh, programs or uh, money that we're spending. 10% uh, of CEOs um, also believe that the leadership development initiatives don't have a clear business impact. And that also relates to the reason why a lot of people in the polls spoke about why aligning uh, you know, leadership development to business strategy is a gap because there's, there's just no visible impact that we can see, right? Um, if we go to what are some of the trends that in today's context that I, I would want to speak about the challenges, right? Uh, which is the next slide, where there are four trends which I've also detailed out in my chapter in the book uh, that we have recently launched on the future of work. The first image that you see here, uh, which is the Uber Fever one, is the whole rise of the gig economy, right? Um, there has been an in incremental increase, and especially Asia is one of the biggest economies that are going to recruit and hire and have a huge dependency on the gig economy. Um, you know, roles are not going to be uh, permanent anymore. We are going to be looking at more outcome focused roles and teams and the whole rise that is there. And so hence, you know, what's the question for leadership capability here? The second on the right that you see the worker manufacturing, this is all about the self-sufficient economy. Today, even in India, uh, during the COVID, um, our, our prime minister spoke about the Atmanirbhar um, project and initiative. Uh, make in India and India has been there since 2015. So a lot of com organize, uh, a lot of countries, in fact, are going into how can we be self-sufficient, depend on local labor, depend on local leadership, whether it's been Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines as well. There has been a huge influx earlier around importing talent, especially at senior leadership. Right. Right now, it's all about how do I localize um, this? The third on the bottom where you see multiple different diverse people, it's all about diversity and demographics. Um, Asia specifically is seeing a huge gap, whether there are countries like Japan, which have a huge older population uh, where productivity is of question and leaders are thinking about how can I make them productive. While there are countries like India, where we have 65% of our population in the working class, and we're struggling with creating equal job opportunities, right? And upskilling them uh, for what's really coming, right? And on the last that you see is really about uh, digital disruption. Um, we, we are in the midst of industry 4.0. We're already seeing industry 5.0, which we call a collaboration between uh, humans and robots. So, um, you know, what's, what's really the call and, you know, kind of speaking to what are the capabilities that we really need given these trends, right? So if I come back to now, given these trends and given these statistics, uh, and this is, you know, my 12 years of experience in leadership development, where I've worked across multiple organizations, both with MNCs, startups, India-based organizations, conglomerates, um, you know, there are these three pillars of critical uh, leadership uh, development uh, which, which I've defined on the next slide. The three of them are um, strategy, design, and approach, right? Uh, which is again to the poll questions that we had. Um, the lack of um, CEO buying into leadership development strategy, a lot of us talk about talent being a priority, but how much of it is aligned to a business strategy and a part of it, right? In our reviews with our business a lot of us don't so just to state an example i was working for a, 
uh, consulting for a chemical manufacturing organization fertilizer as its presence in Southeast Asia as well from their manufacturing plants. Um, a lot of you know, good programs would happen over a period of time for their employees, the manufacturing and sales employees. But ultimately at the end of the year, um, people would go back to um, not being able to apply some of what they were learning. And um, so when, when I studied, we studied the programs and the reasons for why this was happening, a clear reason was that at, at a very basic level, we were not able to sh sh make shifts into the approach and the processes of how the managers conducted business, um, the policies that were there, which did not enable them to take risk or experiment with the learning that you know, they were able to apply. So clearly there is a huge gap that is being witnessed at a very strategic level, which needs to be filled. The second one bucket is on design. I think, okay, we have, we are aligned to strategy, but a lot of places where I see the design is the whole simple one fits for all. We may speak to a few participants, we may get some feedback, but uh, today the design is not catered to context firstly, um, as well as um, completely misses what our user really needs, right? And I'm gonna uh, hopefully share a bit of how we can uh, tighten this whole design piece uh, further to be able to make these programs even more successful. Uh, and the third is all about approach. I think uh, today uh, we are moving into the generation of personalization, like you know, all our consumer products, etc., are moving. Right? We are in the Netflix of learning, in in many ways. Um, I think again here we need to understand that it's not about. I've put an executive or a manager through a one-week program in a SMU or a nice Harvard kind of a school. Uh, and, and that's it, right? That's learning. And I, I expect this leader to emerge uh, given the circumstances. Um, but that's not it, right? We all, it, it needs to be a continuous journey, right? And I think COVID has shown us the lack of application in our learning approach. Um, and I'll just sum it up with saying that uh, we need to have the future focus application, right? So, uh, so that we're much prepared as individuals to be able to deal with the ambiguity um, that we face on a daily basis now. So, so yeah, strategy, design and approach to me are some of the gaps and challenges that I feel leadership development um, needs to fix. So let's, that's a great uh, introduction. What are some practical strategies for organizations to future-proof their talent, Nepur? John, are you asking me to throw a silver bullet here? Because I don't <laughs> as best as you can. Um, and j I just want to also remind our, our viewers, please uh, feel free to, to I, I'm sure you, you guys might uh, be inspired or, or have a certain question that you might want to ask Nepur. We will have some time uh, near the end uh, where we'll have some Q&A and we'll put you on the line. Uh, but with that, um, just Nepur, just the uh, floor is yours. Oh, thanks. So I really like this quote by Professor Minoush from uh, the LSE school, right? He talks about that earlier the jobs were about muscles. Uh, now they're about the brains, but in the future, they'll be about the heart. And with this, I want to focus that um, the best way to future-proof your talent is really focusing on the right skills. Um, and I'm not saying that the skills are right, at, you know, in a particular period of time, but to combine not just the technical competency of people, but also look into empathy um, and uh, compassion and mindfulness as we're also talking about these important skills that are going to be helping leaders and people to uh, be resilient. Uh, a talent today may not be a talent tomorrow and we've seen that in the crisis. A lot of the high potential talent that we tag have not necessarily uh, you know, served us in this crisis, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an opportunity to build uh, these capabilities. So I won't get into what are the capabilities or skills that we need to build, but I just thought I'd leave you with this quote to help you think about um, you know, having the combination of the muscle brain and the heart in um, while, while defining the capabilities that you would want to build your talent for.
Okay, but um, let's let's get into um, you know the next slide where I'm highlighting um, you know so the first one which is what exactly the poll talk about context conquers content. Um, and let me um, share an example of um, you know my recent work with um, a, a large technology company, uh, Microsoft in India that I did work with, right? Um, and what I mean here is that a lot of our learning and leadership development has focused on getting the content right. So do I have the right uh, slides in? Do I have the right speakers in? But in what context are you really putting this whole Con, you know, and relating to the participants today, it's all about that relationship with your business, with your ecosystem and to the individual. This whole triangulation is a context in which you must deliver. And that's exactly what happened in, in, in the program that we designed um, last year was, um, you know, Microsoft was growing. There was a culture change happening in Microsoft uh, uh, due to Satya Nadella coming in. Um, you know, India and we've seen digital revolution take place. So, you know, there was a huge demand for their product and services. And then they had their internal context of leaders. Given this context, we designed a 12 month journey. And at every point as the context was changing, we kept revising um, our journey as well to keep including, um, uh, you know, the right content. So, for example, if they felt they stumbled upon not being able to reach out to getting an outside in perspective from startups in the healthcare and agriculture space, mm -hmm. which is where they wanted to go. Um, you know, we brought in experts to be able to share with them that specific context in which uh, they could also expand their perspective and horizon. Uh, the second strategy that I would recommend is the democratization of leadership. Uh, here, there are two things that I'm talking about. I think today it's important to build an inclusive um, approach towards leadership. What I mean is that we need to move away from who we define as leaders, right? Typically, which we say are your top two or three levels that we call, but it's really about uh, leadership is something that individual, irrespective of the people responsibility, need to exercise, right? It's all about exercising. So how can we as HR and business, think about everybody in our, um, you know, in our organization and leaders, right? And the second is um, a lot of when we talk, think about learning strategy and leadership strategy, again, it's meant for a certain sect of people. So how can we enable opportunities for all? And in my recent conversation with 3M, which is again, a very international organized conglomerate, having healthcare, uh, manufacturing, etc. cetera, set up. Uh, COVID has made them think about uh, changing their policy to have an inclusive uh, talent approach um, to, um, to leadership. So that's a thought that I would definitely leave because I think everybody, um, and I've written a little bit more about this in the chapter as well, because I know there are budget constraints that are, you know, cost efficiencies that we need to look into, but definitely a way forward as we think about it. The third strategy really is uh, bringing to the design part of uh, what I was talking about. So the first two, as you would see, is a lot around the strategy uh, bucket of uh, leadership development. This we're talking about the user. And here again, this, this, this is derived from uh, how products are designed 20 years back by IKEA and the world by really having that empathetic approach, you know, the design thinking approach to this. And we need to build the same in our leadership development programs and in our approach, uh, just bringing in um, the participant at the center uh, and the stakeholders there. Again, just taking the example of Microsoft, right? We build a design council, which not just involved the participant, but the leadership team, which had the CEO and his minus one reports. We had the HR people of the different businesses that were involved to kind of contribute uh, every quarter in the 12 month journey, not just at the beginning, not just at the end as to what went well, but every quarter to, you know, how the journey is going, what do we want to do? And also catering to the individual needs at every, in, in the whole journey map. So it's important to keep the participant at the center and be empathetic to what they really need. Uh, one of the basic adult learning principles as 
most of you who may you know come from the industry uh, would know that it's about adults learn when they find meaning in it right mm -hmm. when they feel that this is relevant to me uh, how do you make that relevant uh, at every stage so user centered design for sure the fourth is coming to uh, now the approach part of leadership development is um, personalizing learning experience uh, i've already spoken uh, about it but i think technology here plays a huge role to personalize it and luckily we have various platforms ranging from your edcast to digweed to uh, success factors and smaller companies that are also doing some work but it's about um, personalizing the whole journey keeping the cent the person centered and looking at uh, what i like to call the 5e framework which again is something that i've expanded the 5e are um, evaluation uh, experience education um, um, and um, uh, exposure right and how do we kind of bring at each level uh, and make our participants understand what is it the skill gap through evaluation that you're missing and then kind of personalize the experience by giving them a mentor or a coach uh, through the education programs that you're doing or even through the continuous learning uh, videos and micro blogs etc that we're going towards and lastly is really about lifelong learning i think all of this talks about um and john maxwell who's a very famous leadership writer talks about leadership is not something uh, that develops you know overnight it's a daily practice right we need to stop seeing learning and leadership development that stops when we have completed our mbas after that we do an executive program or you know um or a, a training program once a year you know a two day five day thing but how do i continuously engage my learner um and 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 that could be your on the job application um etc so it's just having that approach and i think it's about learners as well to build the growth mindset and i specifically chose that picture there because i think it's all about learners having that growth mindset to constantly keep pouring uh, and expanding their world view so i'm going to take a pause here um john any question but yeah i think these are the five strategies that i feel would add value to um you know future proofing our talent yeah this is great i mean there's a, a just from these five points i mean there's like a it's it's very rich i think in in the way that we we can approach uh leadership development uh i i do have a follow up question um on context conquers talent um so you mentioned the case of of your work at microsoft um how i mean how does that work like i know uh the headquarters of microsoft it's in uh in seattle right uh or sorry near seattle redwood right it is and 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 they have a they have a some is there some type of mandate they have on how what kind of on the approach or the framework that they have and then how can you walk us through that process of like how that gets translated when you're on the other side of the world in you know one of its regional uh headquarters i'm sure in in india right and and you uh, did you say that you had to that this project was the the participants were for 100 uh beneficiaries no uh this was for about 28 of the top leadership okay. i see uh, i see yes. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious. What does that look like? I mean, I I find that very fascinating. Like your approach, what kind of mandate you got from headquarters in the states, and then how that how you were able to actually contextualize that for India? Because I think a lot of our participants may may be in those shoes as well, where they work for a multinational, um, and and then how what that looked like on the ground. And if any other people have uh, questions, please submit them in the Q and A box. So. um so thanks yeah that's a that's a good question so i think globally uh, most mnc's and like microsoft uh, they have the global leadership programs they have a strategy that um you know uh, get contextualized to every country but a lot of the road programs they do get rolled out um from redmond in microsoft right um uh, this in particular was an initiative by the ceo 
of India as an experiment, um, um, obviously aligned to the global. Um, so the global mandate was, you know, we need to build one Microsoft, right? From a business perspective, that's where they're moving culturally. Um, breaking the silos of engineering, research, and sales, which typically have been, uh, you know, Microsoft has been a very siloed organization. But mm -hmm. when Satya coming in, that's the mandate that we need to go to a client and a customer because that can bring in a lot more innovation. And that's where that's why you see the shares of Microsoft rising, etc. So with the one Microsoft mandate from a very business perspective, there are three levers that uh, you know, you're looking into. One is uh, from a business consumer perspective, how do we approach the market, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the second lever clearly was the culture and talent uh, part of the whole thing. So in the culture and talent piece, the India had the India CEO kind of wanted to build this experiment of building a community of leaders where he said, can I bring in my leaders to come together in a journey that's not about succession or who's going to take the next role, but more about leveraging each other's uh, mind. They're all superpowers, right? They're all uh, very successful people there, but can I leverage it to make uh, my business stronger, right? And, um, and, and so these people who had 25 years of experience plus who had stayed in Microsoft for really long actually came together um, for the very first time um, where they even came to network with each other. And at the end of one year, we were able to build this community, right? And the specific word was community, right? It's not a cohort. It's a community because a community has a shared purpose. Mm -hmm. It has a shared vision and a meaning. Right. And it has a contribution to learn from each other. So I contribute and I take back. It's a give and take kind of a thing. I mean, that, I think that's very forward thinking of, of the, the CEO at Microsoft. I, I would have loved to be one of the <laughs> part of that cohort uh, and build that community. A lot of exciting work. So we actually have a, a, a question from Ralph. Uh, Ralph, you uh, can we put uh, Ralph on the line? So if, you, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to submit it in the Q&A box. Um, and let's put Ralph on the line. Ralph, are you there? Can you hear me? Hi, Ralph. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, just share uh, what your question is about and share your, your question to, uh, uh, to Nepur. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I belong to the leader in the digital world. Uh, my question is how to raise mindset of next generation leaders to be fearless and bold to lead in this post pandemic. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, a very interesting question, right? I think um, as a manager, uh, one is um, to definitely experiment, provide the space to experiment, right? When you talk about bo being bold, being courageous, it's also providing that space, right? A safe space where um, your performance measures, et cetera, are, are more easy for your team to be able to do. So for example, if they do take a risk, so one is create experiments, right? Create um, out of the box um, experiments in the sense of assignments that your team can take. Uh, if you're in the digital world, can you think about something, ask them to come up with innovative ideas, you know, build sort of, um, you know, crowdsource ideas for them to kind of play around with it. Once you actually get them to uh, focus on doing one or two ideas, build that environment, right? Ensure that your leadership gives them time and you give them time to um, fail, to experiment. And if they succeed, it's fine. Um, I can just give you an example of where, uh, you know, we were, right? And in April, we were um, uh, so I work for PwC in India and we were given an opportunity to, you know, do a lot of these e-learning kind of uh, upskilling journeys for our clients. And we said, can we experiment? And our, uh, and our partner said that, okay, you know, why don't you go ahead and build some modules, et cetera, and see. And we were given a free reign for about a month with very limited budget. But we said, okay, let's, let's build it out. You have the network to reach out to. So making available the network for your team to reach out to as well. Um, after a month and a half or two months of actually building on that, um, 
we do, we realize that it's not something that we can invest our efforts to right that's not that's not something that we can go to but the fact that we were given the opportunity i learned a lot about how to create modules e learning putting content together etc um but it didn't go through it's fine right but i had that experiment and now i can at least stand up and say i've done this and i had the opportunity to do this so i think uh, there are two things ralph i would say is design um, initiatives or small work group assignments for participants to for your for your people to think out of the box right get them to also maybe partner with other functions right so digital can partner with finance with hr with production and there's a lot of value in cross collaborating across functions It opens up their mind makes them courageous and third is just ensure that your processes uh, are there to give them a space for um, uh, taking that risk and experimentation Nepore, one of your points uh, in your previous slide was on the democratization of leadership. Um, I mean, I, I'm not—I don't come from India, but I, I know that Indian culture shares some aspects, you know, like across Asia, yeah. on you know, this really respect for authority. Um, how, what does that look like in in an in an organization? It can be Microsoft. It can be PwC. how how do you how does someone uh let's say someone in authority who knows that we you know he wants he or she wants to democratize leadership how do they model that what does it actually look like to to build you know those structures or those norms in an organization so um I think uh, we're not there yet, right? I think uh, companies like Microsoft, 3M, American Express, are some of the global organizations who are definitely have embarked on this. Have they got it right? I think it's a journey of doing this because authority, yes, is more prevalent in Asia, but it's prevalent everywhere else as well, right? But that's because power comes with authority, and you know we've done that work through adaptive leadership, and we know how that works in organizations and governments. but i think um, with a lot of organization structures flattening right now um because of and even with covid a lot of examples and you know people are thinking about flattening the organization structure to enable decision making to be faster right and if we want decisions to happen that needs we need people to be able to take those decisions and and that's where uh, one is that you start uh, treating everybody and you know you still start building a, it's a it's a long journey of building a mindset right but i think the first formal step is the ceo believing that everybody is a talent everybody is a potential right and not saying that uh, because potential as you know through carol dweck's work and growth mindset all humans have potential and i'm a big believer of it it's just about at that time and space in which the potential gets unleashed so i think it's a very top down strategy also to make that shift in 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 our minds yeah. um um for the leaders at the top to embrace this concept it doesn't happen through a bottoms up approach right because the leaders need to start empowering their bottom down to start taking decisions to start treating them as equals um allow them to share their voice so again um co-designing co-creating solutions is an important part of um you know democratizing leadership mm -hmm. right when you start involving so the recent um, uh, rpg is a huge conglomerate in india and they've spoken about um, work from home as a policy um for for it's a very traditional organization in india right but they have come up with this whole work from home policy um you know for the next um, as a permanent thing which many organizations still are thinking about us it was a young task force that came together to actually build mm. this policy so that's when you start hearing the voices of people and democratizing it mm -hmm. i see i see that that's a great example uh we have another question from angela villanueva so can we put angela on the line i believe she's from the philippines if i'm not mistaken angela are you there 
Hello. Hi, Angela. All right. Hi. Good afternoon, so, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, Please uh, introduce yeah. yourself and share your question to Nipur. Go ahead. All right. So, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Angela. So, I'm from the Philippines. Um, just my question, it's really um, more on, because this resonates with me very well when you talked about um, future focus application. So how do we ensure that our leadership development or our talent development program actually has future focus application? Um, because it's interesting um, to me when you mentioned about, you know, maybe some of the high potential people that we have in the organization, maybe they did not even rise, you know, rise above in, in this current crisis. So how do we make sure that there's future focus application? Thanks, thanks for that question, um, Andrea. So here is where we um, need to focus about the exposure part of it, right? And there are two, two, two things that I would want to say, Andrea. One is if you can, um, you know, if you think, uh, you know, you uh, create the environment again, right? Assignments, so for example, put them in an ambiguous situation. Again, I'll take the example of the cohort of leaders uh, where we wanted to build empathy in them. We wanted them to work on a cross-functional solution to be able to deliver um, you know, an, a business impact. So we actually took them to a village. Uh, we got them to work on a project for six months where they understood the needs of um, of the you know the people who were there in the rural areas of India, uh, built a solution together from sales, marketing, research, engineering ex example, right? And the ability to collaborate in this very ambiguous environment, and at the end of the day, to be able to convince the government of that state, like in India, to be able to um, you know invest into the technology that they were creating. So it's about it's about building either roles. Right. So we've always spoken about, um, you know, role rotations we've spoken about. Right. So one is building in the roles. So if you see a lot of the roles are now merging, right, there's more of a horizontal uh, application of roles that are happening. HR needs to understand business and finance. So can the HR, you know, step into the shoes of a finance? Can you give him a role for a year to potentially lead a function or a business, a small business, maybe right, where your risks are less um, for that? and and obviously supplement that with shadowing or mentoring and coaching so that you're also setting up the leader for success. Don't just make him jump into um, a black pool, but support, create a supporting environment for the leaders to be able to. So one is, you know, the whole job rotation assignment kind of a thing. The other is projects, right? Um, put, them in, put them in specific unknown environments uh, one of the other work that when I had worked for Aditya Birla Group, which is a large conglomerate, is also about um, taking them globally. So we would take our Indian leaders to uh, territories that they thought that they wanted to invest in from a business perspective. And they spent three weeks um, in, 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 in some part of uh, Africa or in some part of Europe or South America. Um, where they understood the culture, the, the politics, everything. And those three weeks made them understood the ambiguity, the ecosystem forces that come into play. Um, and if two, three years down the line, they had to go uh, be a country head for another, for, for their pl manufacturing plan, they were more equipped to deal with the global mindset, the, the, the changing forces of nature that are required. So I would say some of these strategies, it's a very conscious effort uh, that needs to be designed. It's not something that would happen by chance. And by chance is what we're seeing the crisis give us. And as humans, we're obviously bouncing back. But can we shorten that period for leaders to cope and bounce back by designing this um, properly? I hope I was able to answer that, Andrea, and has given you some ideas. Angela, yeah, may, I, may I ask which industry you're in, if you don't mind? Uh, I'm actually joining back to the pharmaceutical industry. Oh, I see. So uh, I will be, I will be um, leading the sales and marketing um, development. Um, so that, that's why I'm very, very interested because um, it's also for me about 
um, gaining buy-in from senior leadership about um, programs for, mm. for future focus application. But what I'm getting from Napur is that it's going to be important first to have that design and mm. also identifying what are these future competencies that, uh, that will be required from, from, from the people, from the leaders in the organization. And maybe that's something that I would still have to you know, think about mm -hmm. um, more <laughs> in terms of uh, just the design. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. And just uh, thanks. I think with healthcare and pharma, right? Um, yeah. I would also tell you to balance with the current needs. So it's a fine balance between um, what do I require? What do my people require today? What does my sales people require today? Because there's this, there's been a huge disruption with COVID, right? Telemedicine coming in, selling online. So I would still encourage you to potentially for the next one year focus on what they need to do today because our environment has completely changed and this is as much as future you can be but proactively maybe think if telemedicine is the future and that we're also going to see can i keep training on a on, on the parallel run prepare them but don't take away from it's important to focus on the current as well because right now people are too fatigued as well um, they're very anxious with what's happening so therefore very current strategy i would say you know, approach your leadership with that. Nepur, mm -hmm. one thing I like, uh, what well, I really like what you said. Um, I've, I, I, of course, I encounter a lot of clients, a lot of companies in the way that they approach uh, leadership development. I, I've, there's one um, te telecommunications company uh, I work with, and they have sent their teams to uh, to a village, they've sent their teams to even another country where for about 10 days, they were in this very ambiguous environment and they, they needed to do everything from scratch as if they were a team of five to seven people really starting, actually starting a business. It's a huge, ambig ambiguous environment, a lot of complexity, a lot of unknowns, but then because they've gone through that experience, they you know, they have so much more confidence when dealing with things in their own country because they're able to con look at it like in different ways. Yeah. And also, also not only that, but of course the bonds that they made as a group. Uh, and I think, so I really like how you, how you're able to do that. Um, okay, so we have actually uh, one last question. Uh, let's put Anil uh, on the line. So Anil, please introduce yourself and, and share your question to Nepur. Hi, uh, Nupur, my name is Anil, and- uh, Hi, Anil, I meet you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're connected. Nice to have connected and hearing you today. Yeah. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So, you know, I wrote a question uh, with surrounding the leadership development over the period of years. So what's really happened over the period of years is there's a set of complacency being set in the kind of uh, leaders that we do have across the industries. I do not know how much uh, do you agree to this, but then there's a lot of exposure to learning which has already happened. Open sources, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities for development uh, submitted by the organizations. At the same time, the leaders have self-practiced a lot of uh, their learnings at the workplace. Uh, they're quite mature with the kind of practical insights which do have which actually blinks out a complacency when anything on the leadership development part stays. So uh, now, you know, where, and, and you know, to justify that, for a period of years when you look into the reports submitted by multiple organizations have done some surveys, some of the top ranking skills required in leadership in times to come has always remained the same in the order, mm. like the top five at least. Yeah. That means, though there's a lot of research and submissions of those skills which are required to be developed at leadership level, somehow the kind of complacency has not allowed the leaders to progress further from what they were. There has been a little kind of an incremental shift, but not a transformation. But now, you know, people like me and you who have been practicing know really well that leadership development, again, cannot be compelled, but that then it has to be a kind of uh, self uh, you know, chosen area. So how do you really influence people for self-development, not allowing them to be complacent and more so in COVID times now? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Anil, for setting. Sorry, John, you wanted to say something? No, no, no. I'm just, my comment was, it's a great, great question. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, Anil and me have connected on LinkedIn and yeah, you know, the chat has been overdue. So um, I completely agree that there has been the complacency and that's why I began with the story of the Sufi saint, right? That we can't, as both professionals as well as leaders, ourselves cannot be complacent about our learning and it's a journey. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, there are, I feel like learning programs are fairly available now, right? There are a lot of opportunities to learn. Um, there's been a fatigue, for sure, of learning, um, especially in mature leaders who, um, and COVID has given us a lot of time to also embark on a lot of these e-learning courses, et cetera. The question around influence, Anil, to me, in my experience, has been um, really to drive the what's in it for me. And the second, it's uh, what's in it for the organization, right? Uh, situations drive people to learn. Um, I, and, I, and I think it's, again, about just creating those situations um, to get them to apply it. And I think, again, it's a question of, do you see a lot of intake of knowledge and concepts? And, and do you actually, are you also witnessing the application of it? Because I think there's a lot of intake happens, application, and, and that's, that's, that's a proportion that may not change tomorrow, right? 90% of what we learn, we don't remember. 10% is what we actually go and apply. Um, and, and, and so we, we keep repeating on those modules. And so year on year, the skills haven't changed, whether it's empathy, critical thinking, business strategy, all of those. Um, I think it's, it's just that, that environment that I've been talking about, which, which I think needs to become part of leadership development. We need to go back to the 70, 20, 10 principle, which has been spoken for decades, but it's really something that we don't consciously build. We, we leave experience to chance. We do you know, create some of those opportunities. And I know some of the more mature organizations also design these experiences. Um, um, but we need to start really building in and influencing our leaders um, accordingly. Um, so so that, 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 that would be my approach to it. Fine, uh, thank you. Uh, you have some valid points uh, to submit. Uh, but it'll be great to hear from you. Anil, you're a seasoned leader as well. I think the audience would love to <laughs> make your uh, comments as well. Well, I'd just like to uh, you know, take cue from what you said about 70, 20, 10, it's been long said, uh, but then over a period of years, perhaps there has been a racial ratio tilted uh, where a lot of uh, practical orientation has uh, taken the onus. So instead of 70, 20, 10, I won't be surprised if it's now, you know, gone to 80 or 85, yeah. 10 and 5. So uh, the learning comes in many forms and doesn't not much of an innovative learning, which is quite happening. So over a period of years, the kind of content has remained the same. Uh, and as you put forward in the first slide, it's a context which dominates the content. So the content does not much change over a period of time. The context has changed. And hence, 70, 20, 10, even if it exceeds to 85, 10, 5 today, I won't be surprised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Anil. Yeah, I, I think it's really about... Um, Leadership development needs to start focusing to make professionals to start changing processes. It, it needs to go beyond designing programs and initiatives to actually making changes in processes, which is whether it's the HR processes of succession management and tying that up to uh, how do I recruit as well. So the whole employee life cycle needs to start taking into account those capabilities. So do I hire for those capabilities? Am I measuring people for those capabilities? So again, we train people for uh, people managerial skills and collaboration, but how many of us actually have collaboration uh, outcome focused measurements as part of our goal setting sheets? Mm -hmm. Very few of us. And some of the changes that we're seeing in COVID is, um, just in, uh, is that people management skills, even as basic as that, is becoming part of my goal sheet where I don't want to know how you necessarily um, how your team contributed to the performance, but how did you develop them? And not just by hours, right? What is, and not just by your 360 degree survey that my team thinks highly of me as a manager, but 
how much investment have you actually made from a time effort creation of space etc what approaches have you taken and, and really making the manager accountable uh, for the development of the individual so some of these i think we need to start thinking about this at a more systemic level uh, to processes and making that shift because none of these capabilities can get built if the processes don't change cool thank you very interesting very interesting uh insights nepur uh, unfortunately uh thank you so much i know you've been going over time nepur <laughs> so we got to we do have to close thank you so much for being generous with your your time and your insights um so we'll just close with a couple of announcements um and so just next week uh we are also we're going to have our friend nishith jain who is a senior director at service now an organization that has been ranked by forbes magazine as the most innovative in the world he is also a co-author with nepur uh of our of our uh, book that has just been launched the future of work how to prepare for it his chapter is on the future of work is transforming how firms and individuals can redefine themselves to thrive beyond covid it's a lot of renewal and redefinition work uh that we have that organizations and even ourselves have to go through today so the registration link uh is included in the post webinar survey and we are also going to be uh putting the link here uh, in the chat box as well um and just in case you got you are interested uh we are running programs designing running programs being ad adaptive and agile uh in person and online on the the topics of adaptive leadership how to think like a future futurist future thinking professional thinking strategic foresight um persuasion power and influence as well as, as well as negotiations uh can we have the next slide and uh for online purchase rethinking asia uh 7 uh the future of work how to prepare for it uh which nepur is a we are very proud to have nepur as one of our authors uh she it is available online at asialeadership.org/publication as well as our other books in the series as well as our asia leadership institute series as well um and i'd also like to announce that we will uh in november have the third asia leadership forum which is now a virtual conference we are hoping to um bring together a real a real learning community to and across a uh, borders and boundaries and different regions to how can we bring come together to really lead adaptively beyond the crisis so it's both public sector it's private sector it's on social impact and ngo so we have 10 over 10 speakers uh most many of uh, a few of some of these are faculty from harvard who will be talking on adaptive leadership futures thinking uh strategic communications uh also self leadership as well as well as also embedding innovation uh, into your organization um during this time. Uh so there's a early bird uh discount uh until September 30. Um it's it's a very affordable conference. We hope that you and your teams can really come together and benefit uh during this time as well. Okay? And uh please do connect with us. So Nepur has been generous to leave her email here. Please also uh follow her. She's really uh, gaining a following i'm also a follower of napur on linkedin so please uh do sh do uh, uh you know see the article she's sharing some of the insights uh some videos uh, as well that we post up of of her and her recordings and her videos uh on our side uh you can reach out to us at asialeadership.org on our our social media platforms my uh information is here as well in case you're interested So with that I uh, just like to thank everyone uh, wherever you are in the world uh just have a good rest of the morning afternoon or if you're in on the other side um good have a great evening uh please do stay stay safe uh stay encouraged stay strong please fight the good fight of making our organizations our communities and our families stronger so with that thank you so much Nepur thank you so much <laughs> Thank you so much John for being a wonderful host and thank you for all the participants who were here great interaction and questions and um stay safe and stay strong Thank you so much Nepur Thank Have you a good day.
online purchase, Rethinking Asia uh, 7, uh, The Future of Work, How to Prepare for It, uh, which Nippur is a, we are very proud to have Nippur as one of our authors. Uh, she, it is available online at asialeadership.org forward slash publication, as well as our other books in the series, as well as our Asia Leadership Institute series as well. Um, and I'd also like to announce that we will, uh, in November, have the third Asia Leadership Forum, which is now a virtual conference. We are hoping to um, bring together a real, a real learning community to and across uh, borders and boundaries and different regions to how can we bring come together to really lead adaptively beyond the crisis so it's both public sector it's private sector it's on social impact and NGO so we have 10 over 10 speakers uh, most many of uh, a few of some of these are faculty from Harvard who will be talking on adaptive leadership futures thinking uh, strategic communications uh, also self-leadership as well, as well as also embedding innovation uh, into your organization um, during this time. Uh, so there's an early bird uh, discount uh, until September 30. Um, it's, it's a very affordable conference. We hope that you and your teams can really come together and benefit uh, during this time as well. Okay, and uh, please do connect with us. So Nippur has been generous to leave her email here. Please also uh, follow her. She's really uh, gaining a following. I'm also a follower of Nippur on LinkedIn. So please uh, do, sh do uh, uh, you know, see the article she's sharing, some of the insights, uh, some videos uh, as well that we post up of, of her and her recordings and her videos. Uh, on our side, uh, you can reach out to us at asianleadership.org on our, our social media platforms. My uh, information is here as well in case you're interested. So with that, I'd uh, just like to thank everyone, uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, just have a good rest of the morning, afternoon, or if you're in on the other side, um, good, have a great evening. Uh, please do stay, stay safe, uh, stay encouraged, stay strong. Please fight the good fight of making our organizations, our communities, and our families stronger. So with that, thank you so much. Nippur, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, for being a wonderful host. And thank you for all the participants over here. Great interaction and questions. And um, stay safe and stay strong. Thank you so much, Nipur. Thank Have a good you. day.